Hi everybody, Golden Era Bookworm here. Today we will hear from three-time Mr. Olympia winner, the king of aesthetics, Frank Zane, on his three Mr. Olympia wins. In this, my third interview with Frank Zane, Frank shares his stories, both familiar and some behind the scenes, on the happenings of the Mr. Olympia competitions he attended starting with the 1972 Mr. Olympia through to his last Mr. Olympia in 1983. Enjoy. Hi, Frank. Hello. Let's see. That's great. I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's fine. It's coming through good. Great. Uh, shall we start? All right. Well, just, uh, yeah, I mean, um, how's things? <laughs> just start with that. Good. Here I am with the trophies. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. They're, um, they're brilliant. <laughs> they are really fantastic. So sh shall I start with the interview? Um, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, Frank, uh, thank you again for uh, agreeing to another interview. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity always, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to um, not just interview you, but to see you with the, the trophies in front of you, the, the three sandals. And uh, today, yeah, I wanted to interview specifically about the Olympias. Okay. Right. So, um, your first uh, was it your first competition as in uh, Mr. Olympia was in 1972. Is that correct? That's right. I had just won Mr. Uh, London Mr. Universe, and I uh, in London, and I went to I believe it was in Essen, Germany, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you got a fourth place there. And, um, but you, in your book, you mentioned that you withdrew. Can you, can you, um, is that true? And can you explain that if you did? Why? Well, there's some kind of discrepancy. My wife was in the, uh, uh, the women's contest and, uh, uh, basically, uh, she, we couldn't make the prejudging for that on Saturday because we were in London. Mm -hmm. So we came the next day, and then they told us the contest was over. And uh, but Arnold pers uh, persuaded them to have the prejudging again, and they did. And Christine won it unanimous unanimously. And then the French contingent, led by Serge Ubray, approached him and said, "Look, if you give it to her, we're going to withdraw the French contingent of two hundred people." Mm -hmm. And so they didn't give it to Christine. Not only that, they didn't tell her. And so she acted, a, you know, went through the whole thing and uh, as if, you know, she was competing or that she won. And then at, at the end, they, they simply said in, in German that she's just there for an exhibition. And so when I found that out, I said, look, this is a big, this is a fraud. And I'm withdrawing in protest of the way you've treated us. Simple as that. And th they didn't, they didn't, they didn't translate it as that. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that until the, the year after I was in Belgium. And uh, they told me that what really happened, you know, but it was already too late. And it was just another example of, of getting taken advantage by promoters. You know, yeah, um, I, I wasn't happy about it, but it was over. So I just let it go. You, you mentioned in your book that it was... Um, a Miss Olympia competition. Is that correct? Because I thought the first Miss Olympia was in 1981. No, this was a Miss Olympia. Right. Okay. It's far, you know, my memory is foggy for this. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a Miss Olympia competition. Okay. And they well, gave it to, I remember, they gave it to a French girl with abs. That's how I remember it. Okay. Um, now, the, you were, of course, present. The 72 battle between uh, Sergio and Arnold is said to be one of the best in the, uh, one of the best Olympia battles in history. In your opinion, how did Sergio and Arnold compare that night? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. You know, so they were both in, I think uh, Arnold wasn't in top shape yet. He was like about a month out. He was a little smooth. Okay. But they gave it to him anyway because it was in Germany. That was my estimation. Yeah. You know, it's the old political thing once again. And I think Sergio really deserved to win it. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say, that Sergio was unbeatable. Yeah. 
yet Arnold got the, the, the win. So anyway, um, you passed on the 73 Olympia. Um, and then in 74, um, you were up against Franco while Arnold was up against Ferrigno, right? Yes. Um, can you describe the battle? Do you remember the battle between Arnold and Lou that night? How no. I know it was the Madison Square Garden and, you know, the, just two big guys and Arnold had, you know, he knew all the tricks, which he used all the time. You know, for him, it was never about just what happened there at the event. It was anything else he could do to psych the person out. Mm. And so he always used all that. And I guess Louis was easily psyched out and Arnold beat him. But I think, you know, Arnold was in better shape for that than yeah. Louis was. Okay. That was a long time, but my mind is fuzzy for all of that. Now, Franco actually beat you that night. Um, can you describe Franco's condition and why you thought, because you mentioned in your book that you thought you, you probably could have gotten the win over Franco. Um, can you describe Franco's conditioning? Do you remember how he was on the 74 Olympia? He looked like he always did. You know, he had a muscular torso. Uh, no definition in his legs. His arms were not that impressive. And, you know, it was more or less a matter of opinion yeah. as who, who the, uh, could have been the winner. Uh, I had the overall look, I think, you know, it was symmetrical and well-proportioned. And I looked really good in the pose. I had poses from that event. I, I just looked better in the poses than he did. Yeah. But, you know, it's sort of like a matter of opinion. Who wins is, depends on who the judges are. If the judges look like Franco and there's friends, they're going to vote for him. It's always like that. So, you know, he, he got the nod, but it was close. They came up to me afterward and they said, well, it was very close. You won. He only won by a half a point or something like that. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so what? Um, the 75 Olympia is famous, of course, for pumping iron. Um, it's known that, you know, you've, you've mentioned it as well, that you decided not to participate in the movie. Um, even though you can see snippets of yourself in there. Um, do you regret not participating in uh, the movie in hindsight? Probably a little bit. I would have gotten uh, really good publicity out of it. But I, instead, Ed Corney sort of stepped up and became Arnold's training partner. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, it, it was basically, I said to him, I said, you know, why don't you just call the, mom, the movie Pumping Arnold? Because it's all about him. It's not about the history of bodybuilding like you say it is. It's always like this. Right. And so I, I wasn't. I went over to Vince's gym to train when they, while they were filming in Gold's gym. It was sort of really upsetting there. You know, it was like you couldn't train because they're always there with the cameras and you know uh, getting in the way. And I was more interested in working out than being part of that. Right. So I think if I had to do it over again, I would probably would have of course. Uh, you know, probably would have gone along with it, participated. But that's just the way I felt at the time. Yeah. Um, how did you place? Uh, because you haven't mentioned it in your book. How did you place in the under 200 pound class in 75? No, I don't know. I think it was just me and Franco. And he was in, I wasn't in that great a shape for it. Neither was he. And I remember him telling me, he said, next year, I get them all by the neck. Fair enough. <laughs> Whatever, Frank. Okay. And so in 76, you know, he, he was in better shape. And he did get them by the neck. Got me by the neck. <laughs> I remember you've told me um, that because of the filming of Pumping Iron, that, and you just mentioned it right now, that you went to train at Vince's gym. Would you say that the facility or the environment at Vince's gym may have been a factor in, in your inability to get into condition like you would have at Gold's and therefore affected your placing at the 75 Olympia? I don't think that had anything to do with it. You know, I mean, that he had a good gym and I, I trained really good there. Okay. Only thing he didn't have was a lot of a good leg equipment. So my legs probably could have gotten better at Gold's gym, but I just favored going there at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't go back and regret my decisions because Things were the way they were. And now looking back at it, I don't see it the same way. So I just had to trust the decision I made. Yeah. 
So the 76 Olympia, as you mentioned, was won by uh, Franco. And um, uh, that was Franco's first Olympia. Uh, reading your book, things changed for you, though, in 76. Like there's this uh, sudden, I see an increase in, in belief in yourself, positivity, etc. cetera. Um, and although you lost to Franco, what were the major differences, would you say, that you undertook to improve your, uh, you know, your, your physique, especially in 76? Well, I was in great shape in 76. You know, it was one of my most muscular years. In 77, I got, I, I got even. And at that year, he had an accident. He couldn't, he couldn't participate. But in any case, uh, you know, I basically, uh, I thought I was in good shape both years. Mm -hmm. But I had more of a winning look, I think, in 77. I was bigger and I was in more control of the competition. Mm. Um, was this the time that you were, for example, doing your... Uh, I say doing your supplement intake that was really over the top, like you've mentioned, 700 tablets or capsules a day. That was in 76. That was 76, yeah. Right. Yeah. And 77, I still was doing that, but I wasn't as extreme with it. Okay. I always took the supplements and still do, but I just cut down on the, on the amounts. Right. Um, you've mentioned uh, something that's quite similar in Barbara Outland's book. And that's about the Erhard seminars training that you did apparently in 76. Um, what was it? What was these uh, Erhard seminars training uh, that you took and, and how did it affect you and your bodybuilding? Well, that was the EST training. Yeah. Basically, it was at the Los Angeles Civic Center and you're in a room with like 200 people mm -hmm. and you sit all day. You can't leave the room. And uh, I never really remember. Basically, it was more about accepting things the way they were. And uh, after the first weekend, I felt very enlightened. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a second part the next weekend. I felt, I felt really enlightened after it was over. I, I really don't know why. I guess it was just accepting things the way they were. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that actually helped you in your bodybuilding in your bodybuilding sure. journey sure maybe more patient you know more focused and patient okay good um yeah uh, by the way was barbara at the course with you at the same time no no okay um would you say that also um helped you in achieving this positive mentality because again reading your biography there seems to be this positivity oozing from the words from 76 onwards. Do you, do you think this Erhard seminars training had anything to do with that? What was the saying? Um, I'm just saying that you seem to be more, more positive um, during 76, 77. And I'm asking if the Erhard's training had anything to do with that. I'm sure it did. I don't just don't quite remember exactly what and the way it was. I just, felt better about everything and accepted it. And also I had more of a clear head. My mind was clear when I was doing all this at the time. Okay. And I didn't worry. You know, the whole thing is I didn't compare myself against other people. Mainly that wasn't what it was about. It was about doing my very best myself, not about being concerned about what other people are going to do or look like. That's a very good, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a good thing you just said. I mean, I think it's very important for anyone to, to sure. do that. Um, so how would you have then compared your physique to Franco's in 76? Uh, like what were Franco's strong points and weaknesses versus yours? Well, he had an impressive torso as far as back. He had a really good back and good lats, good lats spread from the back, uh, good chest deltoids and abs but his extremities were lacking his arms were short and his arms weren't that impressive and neither were his legs he was sort of bow-legged and didn't have cuts in his thighs hmm. and i just felt for the overall look he couldn't compare with me well i really didn't have any except i might i, I might have been bigger or my my stature than i was 
of course, you know, if you compare the look then to 1979, that's when they had the total look of having more size in, in the same amount of definition, but that was, that came later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now to the 77 uh, Sandow and your first Olympia. Um, this was the first time in history that a Sandow statue was actually uh, awarded and presented as the Olympia prize. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of the statue and how it came about to be presented as the Olympia prize? I really don't know. I just uh, know that, you know, Eugene Sandow was sort of the forerunner of modern bodybuilding. He was really the first. Uh, after him, it was John Grimmick, mm -hmm. you know, and then after that, that was the modern era started with, with Reg Park and Bill Pearl. And then came Larry Scott and Sergio. And then my era after that. So yeah. basically it commemorates the start of, uh, of competitive bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, do you know how it came about to um, Joe Weider's possession, the Sandow itself? No. No. Okay. Um, were you, did you feel honored in receiving it as a prize, seeing that it was the very first time? Of course. You know, I was glad to have won and, and received uh, the, the, uh, the Sandow statue, sure. Okay. And then even happier to, to win two more after that. Yeah, I bet. Um, with Colombo out of the competition with the freak accident at the world's strongest man, um, then who were your major com uh, competitors and opponents in 77? I think in 77, it was Robbie Robinson. Okay. He had a great physique, you know, but I, I knew that he would do probably do something to, two months or two weeks before the show. He looked incredible. And at the show, he didn't look as good. Whereas with me, two months, two weeks before the show, I wasn't ready yet. But for the show, I was ready. And I knew that's how it would go because that was the history of it. Well, are you saying that Robbie had a history of looking better prior? And not peaking too early. I don't know. I mean, it was that way from when I when I competed with him. Mm -hmm. um, did you actually fear Robbie as a competitor when you saw him two weeks out? I knew he was competing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw him training at Gold's Gym, and he looked really remarkable. Mm -hmm. But I knew he wouldn't pull it off looking looking like that. He would, something would happen, and he'd come in not. And not at his peak. He, he'd come in past peak. And see, that's the thing about this is that you can be in great shape a month before the show. And if you don't do everything right, you, you can be past your peak. You won't be as big. You'll be sort of flat, not defined as much, smaller. Um, now, what was your training like in, in uh, supplementation, for example? Uh, was it as intense or more so than in 76? Did that make a difference to, to winning in 77? No. No, I, I just trained heavier in 77. Mm -hmm. And actually, well, I was rather late coming in because I was involved in, in making a movie that summer. And I was shooting on the weekends. And so my training was affected by that. And so I sort of got it together at the last minute. Okay. And I made up for that the next year. You know, I wasn't going to let anything get in my way uh, as far as, uh, you know, making movies or entertainment industry. So I just focused on winning and I did. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so you basically didn't do much different uh, in 77 than to 76 to, to actually win the Olympia. I'd say probably I didn't, I didn't train as much. I trained heavier mm -hmm. and weighed more. And I wasn't really as muscular either. I thought it was more muscular in 76. But it was good enough, you know. Mm -hmm. I think people liked me better a little heavier. In 77. But, but you know what I learned is that when, when, you, when you compete in a contest and everybody comes up to you after the show and say, you should have won, but of course I didn't, you're going to win it the next year, mm -hmm. you know. 
because that that's that's the opinion that prevails. Everybody's looking for you to win the next year, and if you can't, so that's just the way it happened. Yeah, I mean, you're you're touching on an important point here because um, throughout your biography, you mentioned that that year it was advertised. Uh, things like the the year of Zane. For yes, I had an ad in the Weeder magazine. I, I basically it said 77, 1977, the year of Zane. Hmm. So I put it in people's mind that I was going to be the winner. You know, they needed to know that, so I told them. <laughs> Do you think this um, this kind of uh, wording or thinking, and then wording things out? And then them having manifest has a lot to do with your success because it seems to be that from this mid to late seventies, you started practicing a lot of that practicing mantra, having this positive mentality and basically wording out your, your, uh, your success, even before it happens to make a yes. kind of law. Do you think that, that you have that ability to manifest things because you just say them? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned that the secret to winning was to win it ahead of time. Now, by that, I don't mean that you cheat or anything like that. It's just that you have the attitude of, I have already won. And you don't let anything enter your, 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 your mind. Don't let doubt enter your mind and act as the winner. See, when, you, when you're on stage, you know, let's say in the lineup, any one of those guys could win. It's who acts as the winner that wins. And so I acted as the winner. I had already won. And so that's why you you practiced mantra and and had that that practice of of speaking out what you wanted to happen to manifest it. Is that why you yes. did it? Yeah. Because the speech is already manifestation. That's already so you, you have the wish, the desire, the thought, and then that gets translated into speech, how you talk. So somebody says to me, like I remember Ricky Wayne said to me one year, what do you think your chances of winning the Olympia are this year? And I said, Rick, it's my intention to win. You know, I didn't say, well, maybe I'll win. I hope I win. And none of that. I was definitely looking at myself as the winner because I actually had already won. And after I won the first time, it was easy to think that's sick them because I had already won. And then the third time too. Absolutely. Um, now, there's, there was a lot of talk of um, mantra and meditation in your preparation for these Olympias. Um, did you do other things like uh, yoga or pranayama, things like that? Did you start incorporating that into your into your bodybuilding, into your preparation? No, I just sat for meditation, and basically, I did it in in uh, my recliner. Okay. said my mantra i usually started off by you know by by doing it with beads uh and then uh, after i do it with beads for about five ten minutes i would just say it mm -hmm. and so i found that whenever my mind is idle it's good to say the mantra crowds out negative thinking mm -hmm. and the whole idea is not to not to doubt yourself not to think about it, anything you know to be the winner and you start ahead of time um, on that note, did you ever practice yoga then or breath yes. control? Yeah. Did you use it? For yeah, I did all that when I started out at, like, at an early age, like when I was 14, I discovered it, got some books and read up and, and actually Hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. You did Hatha yoga. Okay. Yeah. And did you practice that throughout your bodybuilding career as well? No. No. Okay. Just the mental part of it. Right. So the, the mantra and yeah. uh, breath control, the, things like that. The, the physical part was my training and stretching. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, did you, therefore, would you say that the early yoga training helped you in, in developing your vacuum? Because the vacuum, of course, is part of yoga. No, it didn't. What helped me with that was practicing the vacuum. Fair enough. Not the yoga. I mean, I never really looked at it that way. It basically, the it gave me the attitude. 
mm -hmm. uh, but but not the not the physical effects, not the physical exercise. That was all with my with my training and and okay. you know and stretching and aerobic activity. Okay. Um, in your autobiography, you've mentioned now looking at 1978, your second Olympia. Oh, could you do you know which one of those Sandals actually is your 77 Olympia? No. <laughs> they're all the same, aren't they? I took the bases off that had the dates on it, but they're, they're all the same to me. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Um, so for the 78 Olympia, uh, in your autobiography, you mentioned that Robbie could have also won, uh, and you also mentioned now it's the 77 Olympia, and that you weren't exactly 100% satisfied with your win in 77. Uh, did you then decide to make adjustments in 78 for that competition? Yes, I wanted to be more muscular in 78. And I was. And more definition, especially my legs. Mm -hmm. And part of that was due to the fact that Joe Gold's gym, he built a new world gym. And his leg, leg machines weren't that good. Like his leg extension wasn't good. And so I felt like I really didn't get the definition in my quadriceps the way I would like to have. But I, I made up for all that the following year. Okay. Actually, I bought a, a Nautilus leg extension machine and, uh, you know, planted it in this, this, this weekend house we had in Palm Springs. And every day I, when I went over there on the weekends, I would do 10 sets of leg extensions two days in a row. My thighs got really good doing that. Nice. Two, two days in a row. Two days in a row. I do 10 sets each day. Nice. Um, okay, so you also did in, in your biography, you mentioned that you're, you were more determined to come in more cut and defined. You just mentioned that now. Um, but that Ed Corney was in the best uh, shape of his life and came in second after you. What do you think gave you the edge over Ed Corney? Because uh, as many of us know, Ed Corney was the master poser or one of the best posers of all time, at least during the golden era. Good poser, but I don't think his body was that complete. Uh, his legs weren't that good. He had a good attitude in posing. You know, he was very dynamic and uh, he was very good at doing that. So, but, uh, you know, he was a great competitor and uh, I was glad to have beaten him. Yeah. So you, you, you would say that then your conditioning, your muscularity was the, the thing that gave you the edge for 78 over Ed Corning? Yes. Okay. Also, my presentation was good too. You know, it always was because I practiced posing a lot. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everybody knows that you were a great poser as well. Um, Last two weeks before the show, I'd post for hours each day. Yeah. And that gave me even more definition. Of course. Um, Robbie was also in, in, in terrific shape in 78. Um, what do you think then? Because Robbie's known for his conditioning. And um, if you're saying that your conditioning was great and gave you the edge over Ed, then why didn't Robbie come second? What was the factor that that gave ed corny second place during 78 you have to ask the judges that <laughs> fair enough i mean i don't know i didn't care really but i know that robbie basically he came in with a big afro hairdo his hair was sticking way out you know and for fashion that's great but it just made his head look bigger and his body look smaller hmm. he, he presented the wrong illusion there so you think it had to do with his aesthetics well, no, I think it had to do with the wrong illusion that it presented with having big hair. Mm. Okay. I mean, that's that's cool and everything, but not for the body of the competition. You want your head to look maybe a little smaller in relation to your body, not bigger. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, 79. Uh, now, that's said to be your greatest shape, your greatest, uh, the, the greatest physique you, you presented at a Mr. Olympia uh, competition. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You had packed on an extra 10 pounds of muscle uh, and had even, would you say you had a, even better conditioning than 78 in 79? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, what were the differences then in your training and nutrition that you implemented to get you to that 
best condition that you ever had in 79? I don't think there are any changes in nutrition. I did what I always did. You know, or maybe I did it more strictly and, and for longer. But the last month before the show, I went into isolation at, at this house we had in Palm Springs. That was actually a gym, a miniature gym. And I stayed there and I worked out all day. Got sun, worked out, and then ran a mile and a half at night. And that, you know, worked. Now, I, I, do good, I, I do good in situations where I can focus completely. And I don't really need a lot of other people around to do that. I don't thrive off their energy. Uh, I, I do really do better when I can just do it myself. I, that's one reason I always like bodybuilding. I, I don't like team sports. Things that you have to depend on other people for. I like things that I can do myself because I know I can do it well. Mm -hmm. I have that ability, that opportunity. I, I had to, you know, because I have the focus. So uh, it just all came together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, bodybuilding's great for that. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you doing as much running as you did in your previous years? Because you've mentioned that you were doing one and a half miles every single day. Yes. So you were doing that much cardio in previous years? I might have been doing a little bit more in 76. Really? But uh, I felt that's all I really needed to do. And my legs got really good from doing that. You know, I went to the high school track and did, and did six laps. You know, not running real fast, but you know, about an eight-minute mile. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Um, now, you, you also talk a lot about vacuuming. Um, would you say that because you – did you increase your, your vacuum uh, exercises – for the preparation uh, for 79, did you improve on that or did you increase that? No, I, I, I did what I usually, I don't really remember all, the, all these little details. I just know that I was honed in on my training and I did what I needed to do, mm -hmm. which was including practicing vacuum. But what I would do is I practice my whole posing routine a lot. And one of the things I did for that is I, I would work on holding each pose for a full minute. Now you have to hold a pose for maybe five seconds. So I figured, well, if I could hold it for a minute and have everything tense, yet be relaxed, that would do a lot. And it did because posing is incredible work out on your body. It's very, it's isometric and, you know, it basically will increase your definition and also, you know, the way you look. Wow. Oh, minute. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's really amazing. Um, now, what was it that made you pack on that extra 10 pounds of muscle? I mean, you, that, that, that was new, basically. That was very new in comparison to 78. More. I ate more meat. You know, I ate like two pounds of steak a day. Wow. And, and uh, just ate more, ate more protein. Did you? Did you I trained heavier, too. Oh, okay. Was it, so your training was heavier. What, what, what made it heavier? Did you just add more poundage or, or were you doing powerlifting motions or, or anything like that? Well, I used more weight on my exercises. And uh, like I had three, ex three routines, a three-way split. And uh, each routine, like the first day was back biceps and forearms. That routine basically was based around the deadlift, a okay. powerlift. And so I worked up heavy on the deadlift and I eventually ended up doing five reps with 555 on the deadlift Nice from the knees up, not from the floor on a power rack. Squat, basically, I worked up to doing, what was it? 20 reps with 325, mm -hmm. three sets of 20 with 325. So I was always a pretty good squatter. And then on uh, the chest day, I worked up to, you know, work, work up to bench press, doing a single or a double with 300, doing a slow negative. Another thing that affected my, my training for 79 was uh, I met some power lifters and uh, started doing what they were doing. And the concept was do slow negatives. There's this one guy who was a heavyweight. I got to be friends with him, Doug Young from Texas. And he had like a 640 pound bench press and he did it with a very slow negative because that's what builds the mass. 
is that heavyweight. You know, the negative is you're forty percent stronger. So if you go heavier, you're gonna you're gonna get thicker muscle. So I did that. So I learned I learned from these situations I was in, and it paid off. So that's almost like a power building kind of style of training where you're using a powerlifting movement and combining it with bodybuilding. Would you say that's basically what you were doing? Yeah. I mean, but I don't think it's strictly powerlifting. I mean, it's a bodybuilding exercise too. I always started my chest routine off with bench press. So I just, you know, I just focused on it more and went heavier. Uh, at the time, Mike Mensah was in the scene and he was talking about a lot about negatives and high intensity training. Would you say that that gave you also the idea to, to perform longer negatives or was that purely the powerlifters that you met? No, he had nothing to do with anything I did in my training. You know, I mean, he, he came up pretty fast and I, I knew that the fact that he had, didn't have the experience I did whenever I thought about that, I think, well, Here's a guy who's maybe been in 10 contests and I've been in a hundred. And so when I stand next to him, I'm going to outshine him. And I did. Hmm. He didn't have the experience or the confidence that I did because I had more. I, I just had more experience. Hmm. Um, is it Christine that took the infamous vacuum shot from 79? Photos? Yeah, the, the, the famous. Yeah, she, she took all my photos. Yeah. Yeah, just about all of them. I mean, I had some great shots. The other photographer was Artie Zeller. When he was alive, he took a lot of photos of me. But yeah. toward the end, she took all of them. She was very good like that. And I had a lot of sessions with her. Yeah. We took she, photos all the time. But she took that very famous vacuum shot, didn't she? Of you. A contest, yes. All right. Awesome. Um, was that like your, fi your final pose? Um, did she knew? Yeah, it was. So she it knew was. what was coming. Well, you know, of course she knew because she, she saw me practice. But basically, I learned that from Arnold. Uh, in the London universe, in 1970, we all competed. Uh, I competed in amateur. He competed in professional. And I was doing the vacuum pose in the middle of my routine. And he said, you know, you should do that pose at the end because it's your best pose. And so I did after that point. Mm. So we, we helped each out when we weren't competing against each other. Yeah, I mean, I asked because it's such a perfect photo and it, it's almost like Christine knew it was coming and you've got this little smile on your face in the photo. Do you, do you remember what you were thinking in that famous photo? I was thinking about nothing. <laughs> okay. I, was, I never had anything on my mind once, but I was just into the posing. I didn't have any kind of internal dialogue going on. Okay. Interesting. Um, that's from meditation i've learned that you know, how to empty your mind basically just be in the moment right right excellent total focus and concentration that's fantastic exactly exactly fantastic um okay so that was your your last olympia and um after that you know from your again autobiography and from what most people know um with arnold's comeback in 80, 1980 um it's one of the most controversial Olympias of all time, as most people know. Uh, you injured yourself prior to the contest. And can, um, can you explain briefly what happened? Well, eight weeks before the Olympia, I was in Palm Springs and I went out to uh, get some sun and I sat on my lightweight lawn chair and it slid into the pool. And there was a lip that stuck out on the edge of the pool. And I hit the lip... Uh, in the area between my legs behind my testicles and smash my urethra and uh, blood was gushing on my penis. I had a catheter put in and, you know, I lost about a good 10 pounds of body weight. Before that happened, I was like 208 pounds and really solid. And I would have been incredible if that didn't happen, but basically, you know, that's what I had to contend with. And I did, I did. I came in a much lighter version of, you know, what I wanted to look like still in great shape but you know i mean as good as i could have been um just uh thinking 
about the next question. So although you, you injured yourself, um, you asked Arnold for his advice on competing. Um, did Arnold actually reveal his intentions to compete then when you, when you asked him? Oh, we him? didn't. I asked him. You know, uh, I, I had just had the accident I was recuperating from it. And I, I said, you heard what happened? And he said, yeah. I said, uh, are you going to compete? He says, no, I'm going to be there, but I'm going to do the color commentary for CBS. And I, I said, well, what would you do if I were, if you were me? Because I always, before he was, before that, I would go to him, like a lot of other bodybuilders would too, and, and do my posing routine and ask his critique. Of, and he'd be very detailed and tell me exactly what wasn't there or what needed to be there. And so I just trusted him as being that way. And so uh, he said, uh, you should go to Australia and, uh, and defend your title. Mm. And so I did. And then I asked my doctor too, and you know, these doctors, they, they don't know anything about bodybuilding or what, what's at stake here. He, he said, well, you know, you'll be ready for that. Well, you know, I really wasn't. I, I was ready as I could be, uh, you know, concerning what happened. But if it didn't happen, I would have been much, much better. But it is what it is, or it is what it was. Yeah. Did Arnold ever tell you, though, why he deceived you? Yeah. He After did. the contest, I was having breakfast with him, and I asked him about it. He said he used a political analogy, and he says, you know, if Jimmy Carter goes up to Reagan and says, Reagan, this is exactly how I'm going to win the presidency. And he tells him everything that he's going to do. He said, Reagan would be a fool not to take advantage of that. And that was it. That was the story right there. He took advantage of it. Did you feel resentment for that? Then he, said, then he said the classic line, competition is about strategy, not friendship. Wow, okay. But did you feel much so resentment? That's it at all. That's it at all. Did, did you feel resentment for that? For, for what he did or, or I still do wow okay <laughs> okay I, I did of course but you know I, I just brushed it off as here's another lesson that I've learned mm. um, why do you think Arnold decided to come back out of retirement like do you I don't think know. you don't know you know but I think part of it might have been uh, in 1979 it was a great victory. And, uh, you know, the show was in Columbus, Ohio, and Arnold was there, you know, running things. And uh, he had his tux tuxedo. And as I came off the stage, he comes over with his microphone. And he says, Frank, how does it feel to win Mr. Olympia for the third time? And I said, Arnold, it feels even better than when I beat you for Mr. Universe. And that made it on TV. That was on TV. <laughs> All right. right after that came on TV, he calls me on the phone and he's screaming at me, screaming at me on the phone. I said, yeah, Arnold, the joke was on you for that. But, you know, it's he different when you play jokes on people. But now when people play, play joke on you. So he was upset I should tell you. you. Huh? He was upset at you. Very upset. Wow. Okay. And so I think that's one reason why he competed the next year. He wanted to get even. He couldn't leave it at that. Fair enough. Um, uh, on that note, um, I, I, I'm, I've actually also thought about this. I don't know if this is true or not. But do you think that he may have also wanted to actually have a Sandow, an actual Sandow statue? Sorry? I don't know. He could buy one. He was giving them away at his contest. He could make another one up and keep it. <laughs> Fair enough. That's true. He was promoting the Olympia at the time. Um, uh, now, I think he might've won one in Australia, 1980. Oh yeah, he did. <laughs> there you go. He got it. Uh, but that was my point. Like, do you think that's what he wanted too, to actually win a Sandow in an Olympic? I don't think so. I don't think that was the sole motive. No. Okay. Um, during the argument between Arnold and Mike uh, prior to, to the competition, did Mike actually say something rude to Arnold for Arnold to tell him what he did? I, I was there. 
But Arnold said something about Mensur's gut hanging out all the time, and then Mensur, he, he, he lunged at him, and Bill Pearl broke it up. Yeah. He was almost attacked Arnold, but Bill Pearl got in the way and pulled him off. Right. So I think that, you know, because uh, Arnold insulted him. Hmm. Yeah, it, it was something everybody knew. Wait, Mensur didn't control the waste very much except when he actually did the vacuum and he had a pretty good vacuum. But the rest of the time his waste was just pretty hmm. yeah. yeah, protruding waste with abs. Yeah, I've seen photos. It's, yeah, there, there are shots of him with his gut. Corners. I think his problem was, Mensa's problem was that he believed his publicity too much. Now here he comes out of nowhere, really not really winning much or on a national level. And he's right up there and he thinks he's the greatest. You know, and he wasn't in '79. No, in 1980 he was pretty good. He might have, he might have been, uh, he might have won. I think he was be much better in 1980. He might have won the Olympia that year, mm. but he didn't. He got fifth. There's a big, big dispute about that of why Arnold Schoen have won. Some people had him at in fifth place because he really wasn't in the kind of shape that he had been in. You know, when people see you in shape, that's not. Is bad. They usually, I know they they held that against me when I made a comeback in those later years, like in 1983, my last year. I would look really good, you know. I was very defined, but I, I wasn't as big as I had been, and they held it against me. So not only did I have to be better than everybody else, I had to be better than I ever had been myself. Let's see, but not with Arnold. Yeah, that's very the rules true. are different from Arnold. That's very, very, that's a very good point you made. What I learned is don't compete against Arnold. Because yeah. yeah. he'll do something to, to out, to out, out distance you. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't have to be in, in the body either. It could be something else. Mm. But it's something to get ahead of you. Mm. And he admitted it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean he admitted it? Well, he said that if he was going to compete against Lou Ferrigno, basically what he would do is check into the same room as Lou and then make sure that Louie didn't sleep at all that night. That's true. And things like that. Yeah. Uh, during the 80 Olympia, um, did, did Arnold play games with you? Like, because there's a photo of you laughing and him telling you something in your ear. Do you know what he told you? And, and what Tried to. He tried to. I don't remember what he said. It's, uh, I think it was sort of a, somebody said that I just laughed at it. I said, I think I said, are you going to try to psych me out now, Arnold? I'm unpsychable. I've been through all of this. And he wanted me to be in the shared a dressing room with him. And I said the same thing to him. I said, why? So you can psych me out? I said, no, thanks. So I remember Platt, Tom Platts took the co-starring role for that. Yeah. Arnold's partner in his dressing room. Yeah, that's true. Um, there's there's a lot of those photos of Arnold, um, you know, whether he's psyching other people or other people are getting upset at him. Uh, for example, one, one, uh, one I've noticed is uh, when I look at the photos, is uh, especially Roger Walker from Australia. In some of the photos, you can tell that Roger's trust, you could almost see him trying to kill Arnold with his eyes. Was there any bickering between them or was Arnold? Like I have no idea. I didn't notice that. Okay. Roger Walker, I think he was not in contention. I think he was sixth place. He yeah. was the Australian favorite, mm -hmm. but there, he really wasn't, he wasn't under consideration for, for the winner. Okay. I think it was basically Arnold, myself, Dickerson and Menser that were in the running and maybe Boyerko too, but not Roger Walker. Right. Um, Got some questions for the 82 Olympia. Um, you came in second to Dickerson at what was your biggest physique uh, at 200 pounds? Is that right? Or two, 205 or yeah. 200? 200. I think I would look better if I was maybe 195. Yeah. But I had this obsession to weigh 200. And I was good, but you know, I had the. the I had great, I had really good definition, and everything, but I was a little bit 
thicker through the middle of my body than I, I had been in the past. Now, not that I think that Dickerson was that good or deserved to win. He, he wasn't. It's just that Bill Pearl made a big difference. Pearl was one of the judges in London, and London is like, Bill Pearl is God in London. Yeah. From and the, he had a great deal to do with Dickerson winning because yeah. Dickerson, you know, he, he, Bill was his coach. Hmm. So did you? It was right in there for him. Sorry. Yep. Um, did you purposely then get massive, more massive, because the judges asked this of you or suggested it? Part of it. Everybody said, especially Joe Weider. You got to get bigger. And so I did. I figured, well, I'll try, I'll try that. And then the year after that, in 83, I was, I must have been 15 pounds lighter. It was mm -hmm. like 185 because, you know, I figured, well, this is the look that I've always had. So let's try that. Then after that, I was already 41 years old and had shoulder, shoulder injuries and stuff. And I figured, that's enough. Enough of this. And I wanted to win the fourth Olympia. I believe in omens too. Wanted to win a fourth Olympian. Instead, I got fourth place. I figured, well, there's my four. Exactly. Forget all of this. You know, it's over. It's over. With that over, um, and with the opinion of some judges asking you to get more bigger, Joe Weider saying the same thing, do you think there was already that initial drive back then or pressure from the judges, from bodybuilding in general in the early 80s? towards developing a more massive physique? Well, that's what happened. After 83, you know, Lee Haney appeared and he won it for a bunch of years, being a big guy. You know? And it's been the same ever since. Yeah. And came, uh, what's his name, from England? Uh, Dorian. Dorian Yates. Yeah. And then Ron Coleman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Everybody else, you know, you got to be 250 to win these days. Mm. In, in what was your last Olympia in, in 83? Samir won it. You came fourth behind Lee Haney, who, as you said, was more massive. Muhammad Makawi was uh, second. Uh, as you mentioned, you were lighter in this competition, only weighing, how, how, how much were you weighing? When, 185. 185. Right. Um, now, I've seen the posing footage on youtube and and the crowd is going wild in munich as you're posing to i think it's to to the music of, of pink floyd is that right yes yeah that was awesome um do you think that during this olympia there was already a change towards more massive physiques well i don't know i think maybe after that there was because that's who was competing i wasn't around anymore Samir entered the next year and got like sixth or eighth or something like that. Wasn't as sharp. He just tried to get bigger and he didn't work. He got smoother. Mm. Macaulay, I don't think he competed after that. I, I was never impressed with his physique anyway. He had too many, you know, I mean, he had a great smile, great teeth, great abs, but not much else. He had no back, no lats. You know, from the front, he looked pretty good and posed real good. But I think he had a lot of missing parts. And then, of course, there's, there's the favoritism, favoritism uh, consideration for that. For the 82 Olympia, there, there are some Middle Eastern judges there that were quite influential. I remember one of them talked to me uh, between, you know, the evening, prejudging an evening show, telling me how good Makami was and how, how I didn't have it. I was thinking, what? You're judge? You know, and so I think there was a lot of favoritism in that. Mm -hmm. It creeped um, in. Sorry? It creeped in. I, I didn't catch that. Favoritism, favoritism creeped in. Ah, oh, right. Right. Um, with uh, 83 and onwards, uh, you, there, there's a leaning towards the size of equality. I mean, there's a turning point, of course, in 1992 with Dorian, as you mentioned. Uh, and the era of mass monsters like what, what do you think now of today's bodybuilding that it's more size over aesthetics i don't think much of it i think it's gone in the wrong direction but you know it can it can only be that way because that's the look of who's competing and they get good at it you know they're they're, they're muscular monsters and uh, there's just so much muscle there and you have you know 
hard not to pay attention to that. And that's the way the judging is done. Mm. And I, I'm afraid that's it. That's it. You know, they, they have their contests for the lighter guys. You know, those guys like Chris Bumstead. You know, I think he ought to change his name. I think about Dagwood Bumstead, you know, from the comic strips. But I think he was really good. But, you know, it, uh, he had a good vacuum and all that. But I think that he's out of his league competing against these huge guys. Mm. It's just gone too far that way. Yeah. Would you like to see the uh, bodybuilding return to its roots? Or do you think it's like too late? I don't care. It's, it's what's going to, it's going to do what it's going to do. I really don't care. I'm not involved in to that extent anymore. Mm. So if somebody else is going to do it. It's up to them, not me. I'm too old for that now. You know, I've done my share and, did the best I can and I retired and doing my own thing. I mean, if it's going to go in that direction, you're going to have to get champions to carry that out. And I don't see any on the horizon. There was a chance that Bob Paris could be that, but he never made it. Yeah. You know, and then a couple other guys like Chris Bumstead, I don't know, you know, he never made it either. So I think it's just gone too far in the other direction. Fair enough. I mean, you've mentioned Chris Bumstead a couple of times, and that's uh, basically the modern classic physique uh, division now. Yeah. Then, what's your opinion about that? Like, um, how how far or how close is it to the presentation you guys had back then? I don't know. I never really liked, watched it that closely, but I think it's probably better than nothing. But it still doesn't have the prestige of the overall title. Yeah. You know? They talk about the big guy who wins the overall title, not about Chris Bumstead or somebody who goes in, you know, this ancillary uh, contest that they invented for him. Mm. It doesn't have the prestige of the overall title. That's true. Too bad. Too bad. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, that was basically my my questioning for for the Olympias today, uh, Frank. So, um, yeah. I think we're also on time now. Perfect hour. <laughs> good, good. Maybe uh, somebody will come along and revive that, but I don't see it. You know, uh, maybe Steve Reeves will be reincarnated and, uh, you know, just walk away with the whole thing. You never know. <laughs> you never know. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> right. Um, well, you know, he inspired a lot of people. He was my main inspiration. It was Reeves. Mm. so but you know i mean it's the bodybuilding still has a long way to go and physiques are getting you know they're basically training methods and supplements and training equipment is getting better all the time so you know somebody can come along and do it mm. that's true okay uh i don't know if there's anything else you want to say uh frank or well, you know, if somebody asks me, I'll help them along those lines, but nobody asks. Of course, they'd have to pay, but, uh, you know, I'd be willing to do it because I know a lot. You know, I've had the experience of going through all of that, and I think somebody needs a good good coach, teacher to get, to get there. I could help them with a lot of stuff, presentation especially. You've had Sadiq working with you. Yeah, Sadiq. Great potential, you know, but he basically, I think he wanted to raise a family. He's had at least one child now. And right. he, he went that direction. Okay. He could have been really, you know, he was good. There's another guy that could be really good, but I don't know what his ambitions are. Is Michael Hearn. Mm -hmm. Do you know who he is? Yeah, Michael Hearn, of course, but um, he never really competed. No, I guess he doesn't, he doesn't care. Uh, but see, there, there's not a lot of uh, motivation to compete in these shows. I mean, what do you get? You, you spend your life trying to do that. And what do you get? The rewards are paltry compared to what you might make in doing something else. Mm. So I don't blame them. You know, it's just let let the monsters have their day, I guess. That's the way it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, um, I think we're, we're up to time now, Frank. Um, just want to thank you again for your time and for answering my my questions on sure, my pleasure anytime yeah. and send me make sure you send me a link to the broadcast when you're ready to post it will do <laughs> okay.
Thanks very much also for uh, showing your sandals today there. They're fantastic. Yeah, they were asking about you if they could be on the show again. So we brought them on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, they're fantastic. They're really good. I got to go take them back down into the gym. So, okay. No but problem. they, they uh, enjoyed being on, on the program. So <laughs> they thank you too. Thank you very much. All right, Frank, we'll be in touch. Thank you again. Okay. Take care, Carlos. You too. Bye bye. Bye, Frank. So that was Frank Zane on his experiences of each Olympia he competed in, and as a special treat, he even brought his three sandals along. I have to admit that these interviews with Frank Zane have been rather revealing in how he has explained his full blueprint, so to speak, and the ongoings and influences such as politics and so on, which would influence the outcome of each competition he participated and his career in general. This particular interview about the Olympias I found very intriguing as Frank spoke about some things I had never heard him talk about before. In all honesty, I could almost feel a bit of emotion in the form of frustration and even a bit of resentment in that he realized that some opportunities were lost in his career, but you know, we all live and learn. I really have appreciated Frank's honesty in sharing his feelings and sentiments and I have learnt a lot by listening to him. I have truly enjoyed bringing you these interviews with Frank Zane and will continue to bring more interviews with more Golden Era legends soon such as interviews with Robbie Robinson and others. So I do hope you have enjoyed these interviews with Frank Zane and if you have please give the video a like, subscribe if you haven't done so yet and let me know your comments. As I mentioned, Frank really opened up in this interview and revealed a lot, including his feelings over Arnold and the 1980 Mr. Olympia, his lost opportunity in both films, Pumping Iron and The Comeback. So I want to hear your comments in the comment section. In the future, I will revisit these interviews and explain in more detail his different training programs and different diets that he undertook throughout the different phases of his career, which I think I will enjoy researching and bringing to you. Anyway, that's it from me. This is the Golden Era Bookworm. Hope you enjoyed the video. Bye for now. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Vince Deronda's approach to bodybuilding, his principles, and all these tips of wisdom that he has, I mean, there's so much stuff that probably hasn't been proven by science, and it will take science to prove or disprove uh, Vince. But to be honest, these three books, I believe, which I call the Classic Physique Bundle, are the best books that Vince ever came out with. And they, of course, are the Wild Physique, the Master Series, and the Pro Series. Have a look at it this way. The Wild Physique, I believe, is like the ABCs of Vince Deronda's principles to bodybuilding. He teaches you the exercises and his principles. But how do you put them together? Well, the Master Series is a 14-month program of using all of these principles, all of the diets that Vince came out with, all of the exercises. And believe me, it's a brilliant, brilliant program. Many people have used it. I know I know personally a lot of uh, bodybuilders that have actually used it and uh, f made fantastic results with it. And of course, the Pro Series was a book that he came out with later on, specially targeted for uh, getting into competition. It's just the, these three books, as I call it, the Classic Physique Bundle, uh, Vince's best work, and available, of course, at www.goldenerabookum.com. Now, the Pro Series of Bodybuilding, which was targeted for professional bodybuilders, is a contains six programs, each of which go for two months each, so it's a whole year uh, again, in preparation for competition. Need a bodybuilding poster for your gym or office? Then check out ironmanmagazinearchive.smugmug.com for the highest quality posters on the planet. Scroll through the galleries of all the legends, including greats such as Arnold, Frank Zane, Sergio Oliva, Serge Nubre, Tom Platts, and Larry Scott, and much, much more, and select your poster now. To support your favorite YouTube channel, please visit teespring.com slash store slash golden era bookworm for merchandise, including t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, phone cases, and much, much more. Once again, at teespring.com slash store slash golden era bookworm. Become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash golden era bookworm for hard to find books, scans of rare photos and articles on the golden era of bodybuilding.
To take full advantage of my collaborations, use code GEB20 with nspnutrition.com and vincegeronda.com as well as code bookworm12 at osl.com for a discount at checkout.